to another Clear Mountain interview. Uh, today we feel quite blessed and very happy to be introducing and to be able to speak with Doug Smith. So thank you, Doug, for coming. Thanks very much, Bantes. So just read a short biography of Doug for anyone who's not familiar with him yet. So Doug Smith is the creator and namesake of the popular YouTube channel Doug's Dharma. He is a contributor to the Journal of the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies in the Oxford Handbook of Buddhist Ethics. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and has many years of practice in the Zen and insight traditions. As well as being the founder and director of the Online Dharma Institute, which has a number of courses which people can sign up for. He is also study director of the Secular Buddhist Association, in addition to his YouTube channel. Doug hosts the lively podcast, Dig in the Dharma, with his friend John Aaron. To learn more about Doug, you can visit his website, www.dougsdharma.com. So, Doug, yeah, thank you again. Thanks very much. Yeah. Well, uh, glad to be here. <laughs> I thought maybe just to start with uh, a question, um, many of those different things which you're related to, which we just rattled off, are in relationship to this concept of secular Buddhism. And we're just wondering if you could uh, describe that. What is secular Buddhism? To what extent is it secular? To what extent is it is it Buddhism? Yeah, I mean, this is a huge question. Uh, now, you say that I was, you know, I, I was for a time a study director at, this, at the SBA, Secular Buddhist Association. Uh, I left that off a few years ago just because uh, time constraints. Um, but um, you know, I'm still uh, fond of them, and, and they do they do good work. Um, what is secular Buddhism? Well, secular Buddhism is a lot of things to a lot of different people. It's it's difficult to sort of put it in a box. And I think a lot of I want to I want to step back from that a little bit because uh, I think if depending on who you're asking, they're going to have they, they may have a very specific answer as to what secular Buddhism is. But the problem is that it's a kind of a thing that isn't a thing. I mean, it's something that a lot of different people sort of have affinity towards uh, because basically they're all, they're drawn to the Buddhist Dharma, they're drawn to the Buddhist practice, but they're just not particularly interested in some of the more speculative claims that you find in traditional Buddhism such as claims about future lives, about past lives, perhaps claims about certain kinds of supernatural abilities that the, the Buddha or others may claim to have. Those a lot of people feel a little bit uncomfortable with, perhaps. And so, um, you know, when I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I moved away from New York a few years ago, uh, but when I was in New York, my, my sangha was New York Insight. And, you know, when I would go to, uh, sangha, you know, talks or dharma talks, whatever. Uh, there would always be a certain group of people that I would notice who, you know, when when talk got to those kinds of subjects, they would sort of, you could tell that they were uncomfortable with it, and I wasn't the only one. And it's sort of like they were more interested in, a, a, you know, um, dharma talks that were structured around a this life practice, and that's pretty much what I think of as secular Buddhism is. Uh, a Buddhism that's more oriented towards practice in this life right here and now. And, you know, if there are future lives, fine, okay. Um, if if I've had past lives, fine, okay. But I don't really see that myself. The Buddha was, uh, you know, he was certainly said a number of times that if you don't see something for yourself, then, you know, you can you can have faith in it. But, uh, you, you know, there's there's no reason to have belief in something that you don't experience for yourself. So... We leave that aside. Um, and I think, I guess that to me is sort of the heart of what a secular Buddhist orientation uh, is. Now, you asked about the difference between secular and Buddhism. Um, secularism means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And one of the reasons why um, my channel used to be called Doug's Secular Dharma, and I took the word secular out, right. um, uh, partly because it was a nice alliteration, Doug's Dharma sort of rolls off the tongue easier. Uh, but partly because a lot of people get turned off by the word. The word itself becomes a stumbling block. People think of secular as something that's opposed to religion. Um, I don't mean it that way. Um, and when I think we talk about, for instance, a secular government or a secular institution, we're not talking about a government or an institution that's opposed to religion. We're talking about something 
that is a broad tent, that is open to people with different backgrounds, that perhaps doesn't um, privilege one particular interpretation or one particular religion, but that's open to people of different traditions. Um, and that's how I look at the word secular and why I don't think that it's opposed to the word Buddhist. Um, but again, other people may interpret it different ways. So, you know, another reason why I call it Doug's Dharma is sort of my only interpretation, my own interpretation. And so, you know, there are other ones, other, you know, Stephen Batchelor has a very sort of a somewhat different take. Um, but in any event, that's kind of where, where I'm coming from. That's fantastic. Um, I'm curious if, uh, in addition to changing the name of the YouTube channel, um, removing that word secular from it, in one of your videos, and for people who don't know, Doug's Dharma, the YouTube channel, just has so many great videos explaining different Buddhist and secular Buddhist concepts. And in one of your videos, actually explaining secular Buddhism, uh, you explain that it's a relatively new concept, relatively. Um, but I'm curious if your own understanding of it has changed um, in the last decade or two decades or or longer that you've been been practicing it, and if it has, then uh, what do you think if, has influenced that change? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I don't think my interpretation has changed that much. Um, what I will say is that when I first came to a lot of these concepts, I came out of, um, that is to say, the concepts I'm talking about with Buddhism and so on, I came it's sort of a long story. I don't want to get into all of it, but uh, you know, I, I had a Buddhist practice when I started uh, university, even before then. Um, then at, at university, and, and then later in graduate school um, in philosophy, I sort of gave that up at a certain point because I couldn't reconcile some of the views and claims in traditional Buddhism with what I was learning in philosophy. So I sort of that, that that tension sort of um, uh, made me give up my Buddhist practice. I then got sort of more in in deeper into a sort of a secular uh, that is a secular humanist kind of interpretation of the world, um, which was somewhat more antagonistic towards sort of general religious views, you know, across the board. Not Buddhism in particular, because I always had Buddhism; it, it was always somewhat dear to me. But in general, uh, religions I sort of had a, an issue with. And so, to an extent, what's happened in the last, I would say, you know, however many years, 10 years or more, has been a sort of a coming back to uh, Buddhism generally and a sort of a willingness and wish to make my peace with it and realize that there's so much of benefit in the Dharma and in the practice um, that concern about certain views uh, sort of uh, were beside the point and sort of getting in the way, I think. That was, that's... If, if there's any if there's any change that's I guess that's been one but that was a while ago so I think the stuff you'll find in my YouTube channel is pretty much all after that point so yeah thank you thank you Doug mm. I want to piggyback on that question by bringing up I think a very real tension in the Buddhist world right now in, in the US uh, around on the one hand, making room for a more modern approach, um, a more secular approach. I assume a secular Buddhist worldview, at least as I understand it, not only kind of puts aside some of the supernatural elements as extraneous to the heart of practice here and now, but also some of the elements of ritual um, and perhaps, uh, you know, the... Um, yeah, the institutions to some extent. At least I know some might conceive of it that way. And so I, I see the, 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 the beauty in that um, or, or the, the usefulness of it. Um, what was interesting in our coming to Seattle uh, to start a monastery here was we found that many of the sort of more secular sitting groups, um, there was actually a lot of hunger in the younger crowd for a very not secular form of Buddhism. Um, with a lot of these, the language around the transcendent and, and things like that. And, and it seems like there is a tension between um, finding a, having a form that feels very um, solid and uh, like you can put your hands on it. Um, you know, uh, uh, that that form is useful 
but also, like you said, like it's also historically conditioned. It's problematic in many ways. And um, how do you navigate that tension in your own practice? And, and how do you see it playing out in the lives of those around you? Like, it, it's hard to completely devote yourself to something if it's somewhat nebulous. Um, and yet, as soon as you solidify something into form, you have all the problems that come with solidifying something into a form. Um, it's a somewhat convoluted question, but what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a, a good question. Um, um, some secularists are opposed to ritual. Um, I think because of their own, at least in my experience, um, it's because of their own background in a prior religious practice. Um, in some cases that I'm familiar with, it's, let's say, a Christian practice. And they were so, it was so improper for them. They didn't like it. And so when they come to Buddhism, they're coming for something else. They don't want the, they don't want the devotion. They don't want the practice, that kind of practice. They don't want the ritual. Um, for myself, I never minded a lot of the aspects of ritual in Buddhism. I mean, when I was, you know, first getting into Buddhism when I was younger, I was, uh, I did a lot of Zen practice, and, um, you know, the Zen is full of ritual, and, 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 you know, clapping the clappers, and the bells, and the incense, and I, I didn't mind that. I mean, even in, in one Zen center in, in Madison, we had to wear a robe. You had to, you had to actually change your clothes and get into a robe in order to enter the, the Zendo. I didn't mind that either. Um, so, you know, I mean, in other words, I don't know that, uh, you know, if what we're talking about is a secular practice, I think that's up to the individual, what they consider appropriate for them and what they don't. But I think that's true of everybody, right? I mean, some people just are more appro more um, happy with a, a, a more ritual kind of interpretation, ritualistic interpretation, because it, it hits them on a different level. It's not hitting them up here, which, by the way, is sort of where I tend to get hit because I, you know, my background's in philosophy, so I'm, I'm much more up in the head all the time. But I can see the point of the heart, you know, and a lot of the point of rituals is sort of to, is, is to get into your body, you know, doing, you know, prostrations maybe if it happens to be that or whatever it is. That can hit you on a different level, and and as a result, the experience of the the Dharma talk or the Dharma event is 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 greater because you've done these rituals. Um, so my, you know, my general feeling is that, that they can be great. I have nothing, oppo I'm not opposed to them at all. Uh, I think it just depends on the person. If they, you know, if they're, if they're, if they, if they find them useful, then do them. And if they don't, if you don't find them useful, then don't, you know, um, try them. And then, you know, if you don't like it, don't. Um, I mean, the other issue I think that's related to this is one of, um, uh, a devotionalism. And that's uh, that's also, and I think it's very related, but somewhat different, because devotionalism is again, I mean, something you do in Zen, you, you prostrations are a form of devotionalism as well as a ritual practice. And you know, whenever I was in a Zendo, it was always sort of like, you know, well, you're not you're not bowing down to this statue here. You know, the statue is just a bunch of wood or whatever. You're bowing down to something else. And then, of course, the 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 abbot or whoever might will give you a different interpretation, bowing down to the, the Buddha essence in all of us, bowing down to the Dharma, whatever. Um, and again, from my point of view, as you know, if, if I can make sense of that in a way that I feel is comfortable to me, then I'm, I'm not, I don't have any problem with it. Hmm. If somebody's asking me to bow down to uh, a god, I, would, I wouldn't really feel right about that, but a lot of Buddhists wouldn't. You know, frankly, and um, a lot of people who involve themselves in um, in sanghas, uh, for instance, people from the Jewish tradition. I mean, like my good friend John Aaron, uh, who I do the podcast with. Um, he, I think, he also wouldn't feel right about that. So, you know, I mean, I think there's a lot of tensions here that sort of, are in a certain way, cut us cut through the whole Buddhism secularism kind of thing, and just our general tensions with all of us with our practice, and that some of us gravitate towards, and this is one of the reasons I gravitated towards the, the uh, insight tradition, the 
Theravada in- insight tradition is because it was somewhat less devotional, somewhat less ritual, ritualistic, um, but it was still Buddhist, you know. Um, so I don't know if that's an answer, but at least it's something towards an answer. That's perfect. <laughs> Doug, I'm, I'm curious, something which I appreciate about um, your videos, the ones that I've seen, and I've seen a bunch now, um, is how careful you are uh, when speaking about your own views of things. I feel like it's very much in line with this uh, discourse to Chunky, the middle length discourse number 95, where the Buddha says there's the preservation of truth when if you believe something, you say, it's my belief that dot, dot, dot. Or if you have a, um, yeah, a conviction, you say, it's my conviction that dot, dot, dot. Or if you have evidence, you say, I have evidence that dot, dot, dot. And I feel like you are uh, very careful in presenting what you know and what you can know and what you believe as just that. And I'm curious if you could speak to, um, in a secular Buddhist uh, context, or even in a Buddhist Buddhist context, um, there's this concept of agnosticism. So you've spoken a bit about being agnostic. I don't think you've used the word yet. Um, you have in other contexts, but agnostic about super, you know, quote, supernatural um, elements of the Pali canon, the, exist of re- the existence of rebirth, the existence of other realms, even the um, full validity of full awakening, just being agnostic versus maybe other people who just reject such things. Um, I feel like you're quite explicit about uh, leaning in the direction of agnosticism. Could you explain that term and, and how um, being nuanced with it is a, a useful virtue, if you believe it is? Yeah. Um, I mean, coming from a philosophical background, you know, th- those are these are kinds of things that we're sort of taught <laughs> over years and years and years uh, to be careful about. Um, that is to to be explicit about what we know and what we don't know. And um, if we don't have any real good evidence for something, then at least, you know, to say that, you know, and th- that there's a difference between faith and knowledge. Um, now, within philosophy, faith is a bad word. Um, and I'll say it right out, you know. Uh, within a f- within philosophy, you sh- everything that you say should be said based on evidence and reason. Um, now, within Buddhism, of course, uh, faith can be a good word. Um, the question is how what we mean by that, um, and there are different interpretations of faith. One of them is, um, you know, faith. Of that blind faith, faith based on things that we don't have any experience of, that we don't have any reason to believe, but we just believe them because, because. Um, the other meaning or the other use of that term is more like confidence, that we have confidence in something because we've, we haven't seen the whole thing, but we've got some evidence for it. We have some reason to believe it, and so we have some confidence in it, even though we don't, you know, we, since we don't really have a lot, we have what we call faith. Um, now, when it comes to my, ag- you say agnosticism, is because I don't, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of claims in Buddhism that I don't have direct evidence for, um, let's say such as complete awakening or enlightenment. Um, I see it as, at the very least, a, a, a goal that is uh, wonderful to achieve or would be. Um, I would like to think that the Buddha had that. Um, I don't know for sure because I don't, how do I know? <laughs> I'm not enlightened myself. Um, and I, you know, all I have are a bunch of words on a page um, uh, translated, you know, maybe well, maybe not. Some of them maybe go back to him and some of them may not. Um, so all I can say is that I would like to believe it, but I don't know for sure, and I, but I do know that by doing the practice, I have helped myself, I think, at least as far as I can tell, to get closer to that ideal. Um, I see anger coming up less often or being less strong. I see greed being less strong, that kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's what I see. Um, when it comes to other other 
you know, of these, uh, you say, uh, you know, sort of supernatural or whatever you want to say, uh, speculative claims in Buddhism. Um, some of them I may hold uh, uh, as agnostic and some of them I may just not believe in. Um, but, it, you know, to m I don't see any reason to sort of go into that in detail because I'm not going to convince other people. I mean, other, and there's no point to it. There's no point to convincing somebody of some, that, you know, some speculative claim that I don't think is, that I don't believe in. If somebody else believes in it and it makes their life better and it makes them more skillful along the path, then who is it of me to say that they shouldn't? Um, you know, go ahead and believe whatever you want to believe. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't think, and at the end of the day, I don't think that the Buddha's Dharma and the Buddha's path is about belief. I don't think it's about views. Um, I mean, the views can be helpful. The Buddha certainly spent a long time giving us uh, a bunch of views, but uh, so we shouldn't, we shouldn't leave them aside in the sense that they're, they're a path. But the point of the path is not views. Thank you, Doug. And mm -hmm. if we stay on that theme of views for a second, the videos you've done, I know you do a, quite a bit of research on them, and uh, there's fascinating insights, historical and otherwise, that pop up, say, in your video on uh, the emergence of the you know, uh, Tibetan path or um, Bodhisattva goal, the tantric path, etc. Which videos, what are two or three of the ones that have really surprised you the most, um, having gone into them and, and that you've emerged with something that you really didn't expect? Or in the broader picture, has your understanding of the shape of the Dhamma shifted over these years of doing so many deep dives? What sort of, what gems have you come up with um, over these, these, uh, this decade or so? Yeah, that's going to be a hard one to answer. Um, just because there are, you know, there's, uh, I mean... I have a lot of videos and a lot, I mean, they all, they all require some F, you know, some research on my part. Um, I try in every video, uh, to say something that's different from prior videos, you know, to say something new and to try to find some, some nugget somewhere, usually from the suttas that, uh, I haven't, at least I haven't noticed before or haven't seen described before. Um, I mean, there there are some deep dives that I've done that, you know, where I've had to do a lot of research in order to come out with a video. Uh, the one on Vajrayana is one of them. Uh, I have to also say, parenthetically, that that's probably one of my most controversial videos um, uh, because it's based on a lot of um, historiography out of uh, a bunch of uh, very, very accomplished uh, British scholars uh, about the origins of, of Vajrayana in in uh, Shaivite tantric practices. Um, but, uh, you know, that's going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, my, I mean, my, my effort is always to follow this, you know, the, the best scholars I can find. Now, maybe I've misinterpreted them. Always that's, the possi that's a possibility. Uh, maybe there are other ones who are better. That's always a possibility, but at least that's what I try to do. So that's one. I also did a, a, a video on the the um, decline of Buddhism in India, which is a, a one that I had to do a, <laughs> a lot of research in. Um, and another one that's been somewhat controversial, but less, I think. Um, that was that's that's a yeah a big one. Um, another one would be uh, about non-duality, non-dualism in early Buddhism and its its development as a as a an aspect of the Dharma, because um, I mean, Bhikkhu Bodhi has a very famous essay where he argues that non-dualism has no part in early Buddhism. Uh, it was not part of the Buddha's message and can't be recovered from the Buddha's message. Um, and so I look at that, and and you know, I think mostly I agree with uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, but um, I mean, Bhante Bodhi knows a lot about the Dharma more than I do, so <laughs> far be it for me to say anything uh, in opposition to him, but. Um, there are ways of interpreting early Buddhism where you can find sort of little echoes of it here and there. But in general, yes, the, you know, for example, uh, the, the idea of non-duality is not one that you find in early Buddhism, although you do find it in sort of um, some Upanishadic teachings that were around at the time of the Buddha. Um, those would be three. I mean, I, I could probably continue coming up with them if I could, <laughs> you know. 
but well, actually, yeah. Actually, if I could quickly jump in there. Mm. One of the points in the Vajrayana video I found so fascinating was you're noting how some of those belief structures and images used, such as a certain deity or bodhisattva surrounded by an assembly, were actually mirrors of the social environment of the time where you had these emergent uh, lords and warlords um, who were surrounded by vassals and how there's this very interesting mirroring and raising up of uh, a spiritual image of what was also happening in the world. Not to say that these practices don't have immense power, but that there is this interesting historical resonance at work. Do you see a similar historical resonance in our moment? Um, secular Buddhism, for example, is much more, uh, I'd say, horizontally oriented rather than hierarchical. Um, the borders seem to be a bit fuzzier in, in a sense of a wider tent, as you say. And certainly in a democratic moment of society um, or the current sort of societal structure, there's interesting parallels there as well. So do you see a similar uh, structure playing out at all in, in, in the modern moment that you might be able to speak to? Mm. That's a big question. Um, that's when I'd have to really do a lot of research in to come up with a, uh, an informed answer. Um, I'll say a couple things. Uh, first of all, the, the point about um, Vajrayana, I think that comes, that comes from a scholar, not from me. Uh, so I have to, and I, I don't remember, I think it was Alexis Anderson who said that, but it's one of the scholars I mentioned in that video, um, and it's apparently a very, very uh, important paper or book of his where he argues this, that the, the, um, a lot of these Tibetan, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, the, the circular mandalas, the mandalas are designed as, at least in, in concert with a certain kind of of, of societal structure at the time, of vassal and, you know, the, the king and vassal structure. That's his, his claim, um, which I thought was interesting. In any event, I, I think in every culture, Buddhism changes. Um, and we certainly see Buddhism change when it moved to China and Japan. Um, you know, the, the, the heart of it remains the same in many ways, but there are changes, and many of them are changes that are really quite extraordinary. Um, and certainly you find among some Theravadins the, the, the point of view that, you know, Mahayanists are not real Buddhists, you know, in the same way that you find among some Theravadins the claim that secular Buddhists are not real Buddhists. Um, you, in any time that there are these changes, when the Bud Buddhism goes to a new culture, you're going to have this, these tensions of some new ideas coming up that involve changes in... Uh, the, perhaps the structure of Buddhism. Uh, I mean, for example, in Japan or you know, in, in Zen, uh, you have abbots get married. You have people who are in you know in the position of being a monastic being married. Now that would not, obviously would not be allowed in a Theravadan sangha. So the, there are changes that happen as as Buddhism goes around you know goes into a new culture. And now yes, there's more of a sort of a leveling, and this has been a modern uh, phenomenon even in Asia of a kind of a leveling of Buddhist practice, um, which, you know, in secular Buddhism, I guess, is is to an extent uh, even more leveled. Although, you know, again, from my own perspective, I, I, I you know, you know, I, I take classes from Bhikkhu Bodhi. I, I revere Bhikkhu Bodhi. I think Bhikkhu Bodhi is a wonderful, you know, and so I, I'm, I'm not one of the people who would say, oh, I don't like monastics or something. Um, and I think there's a, you know, it's just that there's a different strokes for different folks, you know. I mean, some people want to be a monastic like the two of you, and that's wonderful. Um, you have more time to devote to that. So I'm not one of the people who wants to level all of Buddhism and say, oh, we should get rid of monastics or something like that. I mean, that's just not, not at all. Although I think, as you, you, you're right, that within a, a more sort of quote-unquote democratic kind of culture, um, there is going to be more room for a large lay practice. And, uh, you know, see, you see any number of very devoted, very skillful lay teachers in the West um, and, in, and in the East, frankly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of modernity is seeing more of that. And, you know, I don't, I don't think they need to be at odds with each other, you know. So, again, I don't know if that's answering your question, but it at was, least it's something. It was a great answer, and I didn't feel offended at all and hope 
Yeah, that was great. I hope not. I didn't mean no, to. No, not even a little. I don't know why I would. So, <laughs> it worked. And yeah, glad to hear that you uh, you like monastics, or at least don't <laughs> like monastics. That's great. Um, I have a question, just actually on this um, this broad theme of monasticism, and uh, in your book, a handbook of early Buddhist wisdom, uh, which people can find uh, online, or people can buy online. Um, you basically make a good case that um, the Mangala Sutta, so this is the Discourse on the Highest Blessings, which is in the chanting book, which we usually follow, um, and one of the most well-known of the Buddha's discourses, giving a broad range of the practices of a, a spiritual life. Um, you say that in many places in the canon, like the Asapura, Maha Asapura Sutta, uh, Diga Nikaya, number two, one, two, you know, you've got these you've got a gradual path which is very monastic oriented where people basically hear the teachings and then they start practicing and then eventually they go forth and then they do all these monk-like things and you present the Mangala Sutta as a, basically a lay gradual path which, or that's one way it could be looked at and you, I think, make a, um, yeah, you speak to each of the qualities there um, in a really accessible way. One which is on this topic is the Brahmacharya um, translated as the spiritual life. And in that discourse, the Buddha says that the brahmacharya, uh, the holy life, the spiritual life, is one of the highest blessings. Um, there you t say that um, you almost, you say, I wonder to what extent there might be a place or a space for a secular Buddhist order. This may sound something of an oxymoron to a traditional understanding of secularism or Buddhism, but after all, a monastic is, in its essence, a matter of daily practices rather than having a particular belief uh, having a this life interpretation of the Dhamma shouldn't make monastic practices any different from those of a traditional bhikkhu or bhikkhuni. As of now, all such orders are traditional in orientation, talking about monastic orders, uh, but from my point of view, uh, they don't need to be. Perhaps going forward, uh, there might be some kind of um, secular monasticism. And I'm curious, you've so you mentioned it there in that book, and then in one of your videos, someone asks a question about this, I think there they call it secular monasticism, which is not monastics who are being secular in their orientation, of a this-life orientation, but lay people who are um, taking on a renunciate role in their lay life. Could you speak to both of those? Yeah. Um, I mean, I just don't think that they're, that they're opposed, uh, the, 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 these, these two strains, monasticism and secularism, uh, necessarily. I mean, they're not necessarily opposed uh, in the same way that historically uh, the Mahayana grew up within that same secular, I'm sorry, that same monastic, these monastic orders as a sort of a, you know, a different path that people could take uh, side by side with people taking the traditional path in the same way, it, you know, theoretically it could happen. I mean, and, and there have been some monastics, um, Buddha Dasa, I think, was one who I'm not quite secular, but close, um, had a sort of a non-traditional interpretation of the Dharma in certain respects, didn't believe that rebirth was particularly important. Um, so, you know, I think it would be nice if there were room for that. Um, uh, you know, it's something to think about, but, you know, I, I understand that most, certainly in the Theravada tradition, uh, it would, it would be a problem with a lot of people, um, you know, uh, but so such has ever been the case. Whenever you want to do something a little different, people are not necessarily happy with it. Um, now, as to uh, you know, sort of living a monastic life as a householder, I, I don't see any. Again, I don't see any problem with that, but except for the issue of making a living. Um, I mean the the. I mean the the big stumbling block is that, you know, in order to live a normal, quote-unquote, normal secular life, you have to have money from somewhere um, that you're either making yourself or have, you know, <laughs> that you're, uh, you know, that you're manipulating every day to buy things and pay for things. Um, and at least ideally, as a monastic, you shouldn't be doing that. Now, my understanding is that in many monastic orders around the world of Buddhists, they do do these things. <laughs> they do pay for things, and they do use money. Um, uh, even if not in a traditional Theravadan monastic order. So, um, you know, I mean, all these things are things to think about and consider, and I'm sure people have gone farther with this even than I have, uh, I'm sure. Uh, 
and certainly there are a lot of people who live essentially monastic lives uh, as lay as lay people. Um, and I think that I mean, the Buddha was very clear that the reason to become a monastic was that it made the path easier. I mean, he was very clear about that. You know, uh, living a lay life is a, is a dusty life. It's it's hard to live a life of purity as as a lay person. So, I mean, maybe there are ways of becoming more monastic as a layperson, um, you know, so at least you're making it easier on yourself. I, certainly there's room for that. Thank you, Doug. And you, you don't look too dusty to us <laughs> for what it's worth. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so one thing I wanted to uh, ask about in terms of that, perhaps not lay or secular monasticism, but bringing one's life as a lay person aligned into alignment with Dom at a very deep, deep level. I think for those of us who have touched these teachings repeatedly, their wisdom and power become increasingly apparent such that living like we used to just doesn't make sense. And I know you have a, a wife and um, just curious about for those who aren't in robes, who aren't celibate, what kind of thoughts do you have on how someone like what skillful means have you come up with practical ways of bringing your life into alignment with the path um, while having, you know, while going about your duties, uh, while being in a relationship? And in particular, um, how have you found dharma, any dharmic means of navigating relationship that have been especially useful to you, if, if I can ask? Yeah, I mean, those, uh, again, difficult questions. Um... I think it helps that my, my wife is also uh, Buddhist curious, so to speak. I mean, she also has a practice. She does meditate. We, you know, when we were in New York, we would go to New York Insight together all the time. So that makes things a lot easier. Um, I think it would be more difficult if she weren't, although, you know, as long as she wasn't antagonistic, it, wouldn't, it shouldn't necessarily be a problem. Um, but that certainly makes things easier. Uh, for myself... I mean, I, you know, I have to say, I mean, I live a relatively monastic life in the sense that I don't have, you know, I'm not the sort of person who likes sort of gallivanting around and traveling here and there. I mean, we, we visit family, but, you know, and travel a little bit, but we don't, you know, I spend most of my time doing sort of Dharma research for my videos, honestly, um, or just reading books, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, that kind of thing. Um, so... You know, I think cutting out parts of my life that just, and, and, and let me put it this way, probably the wrong word is cutting out, because if I say cutting out parts of my life that weren't useful to me um, or that were distracting, that sounds uh, sort of like aversion. And that doesn't work. You know, I mean, being aversive to certain things doesn't work. I mean, doesn't doesn't help you on the path to say I'm aversive to it, so I'm not going to do it. It's more that things that I used to find, like I had to do, you know, like I had to go out and hear this musical thing, or I had to go out and see this thing going on, or I had to go out um, and have this this experience. Um, just a sort of less draw for me now. It just as the Dharma, as I get into the Dharma more. I'm less interested in those things. Um, not to say I don't do the, any of them. Sometimes I will, but it's much, much more rare. You know, <laughs> I have to sort of have a more reason to do them in a way that, I, you know, before I would have done them without thinking. Um, and so I think it's sort of like as, as I deepen in the Dharma, it's just sort of like, uh, you know, it's, it's the awareness of dukkha, you know, this awareness, you know, it's like seeing dukkha for what it is seeing experiences for what they are, you become less attached to them and less sort of interested in them. And that's a natural thing, I think. It just doesn't, you know, there's nothing you have to do. <laughs> it just happens. <laughs> um, what you have to do is do the at least some. You have to do some of the practice of meditation, which I, you know, I have a meditation, daily meditation practice, which I'm, I'm pretty good at keeping up every day. Um, but, you know, that and Dharma study, I think, just end up that there are things in my life that, you know, that are just, that just, they don't, not as interesting to me anymore, which is fine, you know, and sometimes I'll do them, and if somebody really wants me to, oh, okay, I'll go along, but, you know, it's, 
it's not the center of my life. So I think that's at least something of an answer. Um, You'll gallivant when necessary, but <laughs> not outside of that. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, that seems a really uh, mature and holistic life integrated response that you gave. I'm curious about the opposite end of things, um, this concept of spiritual bypassing. I mean, in a, a traditional religious context, it's easy to see how someone could spiritual bypass, basically just, um, yeah, I, I read in a discourse or some book that anger and aversion are a bad thing. So I just pretend I don't have them and pretend I don't have the work to do. Um, but I'm curious if you could speak at all to how spiritual bypassing might occur in a um, in a lay contest, in a secular, in a secular Buddhist context, if if it does, I, I just don't have familiarity with um, much secular Buddhism. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't think it's any different from any from anybody else. Uh, I mean, I think spiritual bypassing is something that's quite a general, a general problem, um, and I think one that I mean, if I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I would say. I certainly do sometimes find myself spiritually bypassing, you know, like thinking that I've gotten something that I really don't. Um, I like to think that I do that somewhat more rarely just because of my philosophical, you know, pra uh, training. Because again, in, in philosophy, you're sort of trained to be, at least we were trained to be sort of very analytic and very specific about what we th what we knew and what we didn't know. And so I try to be as honest with myself about, you know, my abilities and my lack thereof, um, you know, because I'm only a beginner on this path. I really, you know, I, yeah, <laughs> I mean, I look at the, at the people that you've interviewed and it's like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm not, the, I'm not at their level anywhere. So, you know, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that kind of, at least I hope that that kind of attitude has helped me at least get away from the worst aspects of spiritual bypassing because i think spiritual bypassing oftentimes is comes up as sort of conceit you know you sort of think that you're better you know because you've done some practice or gone to some retreat or whatever and you know so therefore you shouldn't have this you know <laughs> shouldn't have this anger whatever it is um but I, I, you know, I tend to think of myself as very fallible. So, so I, I, I sort of, I hope I don't tend to fall into that problem. But, but it is a problem, and I, and I, I can't say that I always escape it. Yeah, that's a great answer. It, and it actually just um, brings me to something else I read in your book, uh, the Handbook of Early Buddhist Wisdom, uh, in the section on humility. Um, you talk about it's natural, maybe in the West, maybe perhaps especially in America to have this somewhat um, yeah, naive view that everyone is the same in every respect. And when you were speaking just now, you spoke about you know, different levels, you know, that um, Jetsuma Tenzin Palmo is on a different level than where we are and there being an honesty in that, that way of looking at things. Um, I think um, in the limited interactions that I've had with secular Buddhist spaces, it does seem like there is a, um, the tendency to wholesome leveling that you pointed to can oftentimes um, lend itself and bleed into a unwholesome or unrealistic leveling that there is no distinction or there are no levels of um, ethical maturity or meditative insight, um, samadhi, calm. And just, yeah, I'm curious if you could speak to that and um, yeah. Hmm, yeah. I, I... I have to say I haven't noticed that myself, but maybe uh, you're. I'm sure you're right that 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 some people may think that. Um, I certainly don't. I mean, I certainly think that there are people who are well more experienced in all these things than I am. Um, uh, now, I mean, again, as as a sort of a good uh, philosopher, I'm going to want to know, you know, okay, what is the reason to believe this? Uh, okay, I mean, in other words, I'm not going to take it just on somebody's word, right? I'm going to want some you know, some good evidence that this person is wise and so on. But I, I you know, I have no doubt that there are, <laughs> that there are people that are very, very much wiser than I am. Um, I certainly have known some of them. I mean, Bhikkhu Bodhi is a wonderful example of somebody who's got a lot of wisdom in him. I mean, he's a, he's a really wonderful person to, to, to stay around. And, and I've known, uh, you know, a number of people like, like him. Um, uh, so no, I wouldn't think of that kind of leveling, uh, myself, uh, 
Yeah. Did you have, I think there was another part to your question, which I'm forgetting now. Um, no, I think maybe just, yeah, talking about this dynamic between a wholesome leveling and then a, a leveling which is unrealistic and perhaps almost an, an attachment and a conceit of equality. <laughs> I see what you mean. Yes, yes, yeah. right. Like, I don't have anything to do because we're all the same. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that can be self-defeating. Um, now, of course, there's a related approach, as you guys, I'm sure both of you well know from Zen or whatever, that, uh, that there's nothing to be done. <laughs> right. Um, and that in that sense, we are all the same, um, which is very different from an early Buddhist kind of view of the path. Um, nevertheless, it's, I think, for some people, extremely skillful means, right? Because they, and, and I think this is true of some people who are in the secular tradition, they, they come up, they, they come out of a background where, that is striving, that is, that is oftentimes they come from very um, high pressure jobs. And the last thing they want from their spiritual practice is somebody to telling them, you know, this is one more thing you have to get done and you have to do it perfectly. Um, that just doesn't work. Um, and so then for that sort of person, a sort of a Zen approach of there's nothing to be done. Just sit. Uh, you know, there's no difference between nirvana and, and samsara. I mean, the, Nagarjuna's famous claim uh, can be very useful to some people. Um, uh, and, and in a certain way, it's sort of it's the sort of weird reflection of what you just said that there's you know that there's this level between all of us. We're all the same. Well, we are right in that interpretation. We are all the same. You know, we all have Buddha nature. Um, so all these things are kind of weird, right? I mean, there's there's it sort of depends on your background and what what's good for your you know what's good for you and what helps your path, uh, which may not be helping my path, right? Uh, I tend, as you know, I, I like stuff that's very clear and, and, and analytic, and so that that kind of approach doesn't work for me personally. I understand it, but it doesn't really work for me. Um, but oh, 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 one thing I was going to say is that, um, yeah, I mean, one of the, the differences uh, in in philosophy, for example, that we learn in, in, in graduate school is conceit, right? That you, in order to be a good philosopher in general, you've got to have conceit. You know, you've got to think that your stuff is, is, is the stuff, you know? <laughs> and the guy or gal who's next to you, well, they're, they're all wrong. <laughs> they don't see anything uh, correctly. Um, and, you know, getting into a lot of, of, of uh, the thicket of views and, you know, arguments and disputes. Um, and that is one thing that has been a really profound uh, discovery, in a sense, quote unquote, uh, that I in, in Buddhism and Buddhist practice is a, a totally different kind of way of 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 approaching views, um, trying to leave that kind of stuff behind. Although I have to say that Buddhists can be just as 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 bad at that as anybody. <laughs> and if you go online to some of these online fora, which you, I'm sure you know, um, you'll see you'll see that kind of concede everywhere so it does have to too speaking of views doug uh you got your phd in a realm which has plenty of them as well uh, i know philosophy and i'm curious coming out of that into buddhism uh what how has that informed your thinking where do you see the key differences in the western philosophical tradition and what came from the East and the Buddhist teachings, and which philosophers do you feel like, well-known philosophers, do you feel like kind of got closest to what you might consider truth, to use a somewhat loaded term? Uh, that's a huge question. <laughs> I could, I'm going to keep asking. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I could talk about that for a long time. Um, uh, wow. Um, I mean, I think the biggest difference, between, I mean, of course, philosophy is a huge topic. Um, so... Let's narrow things. Uh, let's just talk about philosophy, academic philosophy nowadays in the West, in the United States, for example. Um, uh, the stuff that I was doing, the stuff I'm most familiar with is, is analytic philosophy, which is one of the two major branches of philosophy in the West, other than being quote unquote continental philosophy. Um, and 
in analytic philosophy, what's the, di the main difference between that and Buddhism? I mean, there are many differences, but one, one main difference is that there's no practice. Um, now, in ancient Greek philosophy, which is where all this stuff sort of quote-unquote comes from in the West, uh, there were practices. Uh, they were not as uh, well outlined as they are in, by the Buddha. The Buddha was pretty unique in that, I mean, in, in, at least in compared to, comparison to the, to the West. But a lot, I mean, for instance, Stoicism is very similar to Buddhism in many ways, except for the practice. The practice is, in Stoicism is, is very much rational, just to sort of sit and think about things. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, but otherwise, Stoicism is very similar to Buddhism in many respects. And there are other, you know, philosophies that are quite similar to Buddhism um, as well in the West, uh, but no practice. Mm -hmm. uh, in the West, you know, philosophy is something that you did uh, by reasoning. And it was, it was historically, um, it's separated from theology, uh, you know, around the time of the Enlightenment. Uh, because before that, you know, you had theology, basically. Um, and when in the Middle Ages in Europe, all of these theologians discovered, quote unquote, that the Greeks, the classical Greeks, they were like, who are these people? Because they only knew the Bible as being the important part to, to learn. But then they realized, oh, this whole other form of knowledge, which is not biblical, but is really interesting. And so they tried to unify the two. But by the time of the Enlightenment, that unification sort of came apart. And so then you have, you know, philosophies are splitting off from theology and trying to, you know, identify itself as being the, 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 the holder of reason as opposed to theology, which was the holder of faith, right? Um, I'm giving you a potted historical, you know, <laughs> introduction to philosophy in the West. But in any event, um, so no practice. That's the big. Di that's the one big difference. Now, nowadays, um, the philosopher that I think of as being the closest to Buddhism uh, is a guy who uh, passed away in 2017, Derek Parfit, and I'm just literally today working on a, a video about him because there was a. There's a. Where do I have? Ah, Parfit. Derek Parfit. I have a book of his. Uh, not out of mm. his. Actually, it's it's a it's a new biography that's just out now or a few, little while ago that I just ran across in a bookstore uh, like a couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, and read. Um, and he is uh, very famous within philosophy circles uh, for arguing for a view of non-self um, very powerfully and very convincingly to a lot of people. Uh, and it was a view, he, he, he published the book in, uh, in his book on that where he talks about non-self in 84, 1984, uh, and I was just looking at it today, he, he references the Buddha in, a, in a, several places in the book as saying basically that, uh, that, the, that he agrees with the Buddha, or the Buddha agrees with him, that they agree with that he, you know, the same view. And um, he actually references uh, Stephen Collins's book, um, Selfless Persons, which is uh, a really wonderful um, uh, sort of scholarly understanding of non-self. Uh, from the early tradition and so on, and from the later tradition too, I believe. Um, so anyway, that's one person. Another person would be would be David Hume, who had a similar kind of, also a very empiricist view, uh, which is similar to the Buddha's, and also had a view somewhat similar to non-self as well. Uh, David Hume being a, a philosopher from the you know the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, those would be a couple, um, but there, I mean, there, there, I mean. There are so many different people in, in philosophy arguing different things that y you'll find people who agree with aspects of Buddhism all, all over the place. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's quite helpful. And I uh, look forward to looking more into Parfit. Mm -hmm. Just before, I think Ajahn Kovala has some more questions to ask, but before we move on from that realm, I wondered if you had anything particular to say about Plato and Socrates. We've spoken a great deal with Ajahn Sona about him. And I know from my own reading of Plato, who's maybe the first philosophy I ever read, there was a luminosity to his pages which felt beyond the kind of intellectual agility of Enlightenment philosophers. There's something almost mystical that's shown through. Um, and you do go back through it, and he's not... There are mystical elements to him which I don't think Western interpretations knew what to do with. I mean, there's talk about rebirth, there's talk about 
what really sounds like nibbana. There's some evidence of meditative practice. There's stories of him standing for hours in the snow, unmoving, maybe in jhana. Um, do you see anything in particular that's that you would think worth speaking to in in that you know progenitor of so much of the Western tradition, which maybe was beyond even what came of of him afterwards? Yeah, I mean, I it's kind of funny. Um, when I first learned Plato, I learned it when I was in university, and it was taught by a professor who clearly didn't believe anything that Plato ever said. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so, he he would uh, he would come up to the blackboard and he would write up you know all these these things that he you know his his reconstructions of Plato's argument and tell you why they're wrong. And so that was the entire semester, and I and I, I ended up that semester thinking, what on earth is going on here? Because I mean, you know. <laughs> First of all, why teach a course like that? You know, what's the point in learning about this guy if everything he said was wrong? You know, I mean, I could better spend my semester doing something else. So it wasn't until graduate school that I finally got a professor who actually liked Plato. Uh, <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the, and the approach of the guy that, that I really that I came to like Plato with was to look at the, particularly the early dialogues in which Plato. Uh, was pretty clearly channeling, so to say, Socrates. I mean, that he had Socrates had recently died. Um, people may not know that what happened was that Socrates was a kind of a, a gadfly who would accost people in the in the agora and the in the you know outside, um, and and especially people who were pompous and whatever. And and he would ask them a bunch of questions, and he would just sort of try to get them to explain what they believed, and they they couldn't do it, and he would sort of show the problems with what they were claiming. And so eventually he made a lot of enemies doing this, as we could expect. And and the, the Athenian populace uh, put him on trial for uh, corrupting the youth. And what that meant was that he was teaching the young people that there weren't gods of certain kinds, that the gods were something other than they thought that they were. Um, and so he was convicted and sentenced to die, and so he he did. He committed suicide by drinking hemlock because that was the that was his conviction. Uh, that was the you know that was the what the court case told him to do. So Plato took upon himself to sort of um, make Socrates into somebody who was great because Socrates never wrote anything down. He was sort of like the Buddha. Um, and so all of what we have of Socrates, really, all, almost all, is through Plato's voice. And um, through that voice, Socrates comes across as, as an amazing, as you, as you say, an amazingly wise and profound and honest person. Um, how much of it is really Socrates? It's hard to say. You know, um, and certainly in the later dialogues, as Plato got older and farther away from Socrates, uh, he became it, it became less real. Socrates is, I think, I don't see as much of Socrates in the late dialogues. It's more Plato's um, thinking out of his own thoughts, and some of it gets very dogmatic at the end. Um, uh, but how much of that? has to do with uh, sort of Buddhist stuff. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but within the Western tradition, certainly within, let's say, the Stoics, for example, um, Socrates was their Buddha. You know, he was the person they looked up to as the sage, with a capital S, the person that you were supposed to model yourself after. Um, and certainly Plato's own views of the forms and this kind of he, he had this, this view of that behind all of reality were these these sort of perfected forms of all the things that we see, uh, and that the form of all things ended up there was kind of a hierarchy of forms that ended up with the form of the good being the greatest form, um, and there are ways of understanding that that are similar to some ways of understanding nirvana. I'll I'll, I'll put it that way, um, uh, but you're going to have people on both sides of that. You know, you have some people saying it's a completely different thing. You know, it has nothing, you know, it's, they're, they're yin and yang. You know, they're totally different. And other people saying, well, there's lots of similarities here. Um, I mean, I would only say, you know, from a ph philosophical standpoint that they're both, one, you know, both incredibly important people uh, in the history of, of the human race. Uh, 
and both extremely wise and both really worth reading, uh, especially the early Platonic dialogues, uh, you know, like uh, Socrates' Apology, where he gives his court case in the court. He, he, the, the Apology is his response to the Athenian court about what he'd been told. And it, it, it's, they're, they're fascinating. They're great. Really worth reading. Yes, I, I believe he suggests that as his punishment, they should give him room and board because his duty of keeping them all in line is so difficult and they make him drink hemlock instead. So yep. thank you for that uh, summary. That was very helpful, actually. Gotcha. I mean, we might come back more to the specifics of philosophy, but on this point of Socrates being a gadfly, just to tie that back into modern day uh, practice circles, um, broad practice, Buddhist influenced uh, practice circles in the West. Um, so at the time of Socrates and Plato, Plato created this academy. Um, so people could come and train with him and they were getting feedback. I mean, anyone who met Socrates, he would be presumably giving you know some level of feedback if they were open to it. And that was part of the discipline. And for myself, when I first became interested in, in Buddhism and then did a meditation retreat, I wasn't at all, you know, came from a Unitarian background, not at all interested in taking on another religion. So I go to a meditation retreat that left religion out of things and got a lot of benefit out of it and basically kept in those circles doing these, um, you know, uh, week plus long retreats. And I started to get weird. I started to get weird in certain ways. I thought that um, the Dhamma was all about noble silence. And so I'd go home and visit family and just be noble silent, whatever that <laughs> meant. And uh, yeah, it, it didn't really fit. I was trying to, I was taking these ideas, taking my understanding of certain things that I was reading about or practicing, but not getting any feedback like I would have gotten at the academy or would have gotten from Socrates or ended up getting at monasteries. So that's why I ended up going and staying at these monasteries because like getting more and more feedback from the outside that you're getting weird guy so <laughs> so you know coming to a monastery okay get some uh, legitimate feedback on a regular basis and i'm curious if that if there's a place for that i mean i know um yeah you have created so many youtube videos and you've got um the what is the name of the institute that you online dharma institute but that's yeah. that's for that's for online courses yeah mm -hmm. right which are great um but i'm curious about the actual feedback to someone who's learning uh, are there forums or forms uh, for a secular Buddhist in which um, the aspirant or the <laughs> the person learning about this can actually get uh, feedback? Well, I think that's a, that's a wonderful question. And I think that's absolutely one of the issues it is that in order to um, really go along the path well and and not fall off into the ditches on the either side is to have somebody who's a good instructor. Um, and there aren't that many opportunities for this. Now, I think in Europe, uh, Stephen Batchelor has an online, uh, mostly online, sort of secular sangha called the Bodhi Institute or something. I've forgotten the name of it. Uh, um, but I think he's trying to do that where they have they have not, I mean, they, they're some of the, their retreats are online, but I think some of them are in person as well. And so he has some uh, quite good teachers, Dharma teachers, who, who teach in that, you know, sort of, uh, as, as I understand it, I haven't, I haven't attended one of them, so I don't know this in person. But my understanding is that they sort of try to teach in a sort of a secular way. And, and to be, I mean, let's, be perfectly honest, I mean, if you go to the equivalent of New York Insight or whatever, and you hear Dharma talks by any one of a, a dozen or two dozen different lay Dharma teachers, they're going to be teaching in a relatively secular way. And um, most of the time, anyway, uh, you know, they'll be teaching you about, you know, <laughs> four foundations of mindfulness or something, and you'll be talking about mindfulness of mind. I mean, you know, that kind of thing. And that's, that's, you know, Nothing problem with no, nothing that's problematic in that at all, for me anyway. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think you know having somebody who can point out to you when you're doing something weird or or whatever is extremely useful. Um, and certainly on my YouTube videos, I do get comments, uh, not that often, but every once in a while, from somebody asking me about some meditation issue that they're going through. 
and I have to be absolutely honest with them and say that I really can't help them. I mean, I can give them a general kind of overview, and I can say, you know, the, the point of meditation is not to have certain experiences. Um, so it's great that you had that experience, whatever it is, but I wouldn't attach to that, whatever. Um, but apart from that kind of general boilerplate advice, I, you know, I, I don't think... I don't think anybody in my position should be giving, you know, sort of teaching meditation to people unless they're seeing them on a regular basis. Really, most, I mean, I think it's better to do it in person, frankly. I mean, a lot better. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, uh, I, you know, if you can't do that, then at least, you know, by Zoom or something that's a regular kind of, uh, you know, weekly meeting with somebody. I mean, that kind of thing, maybe. And if, and if you have the experience, see, I don't really have, I mean, I have some meditation experience, but I do not consider myself, once again, I don't consider myself an expert, um, uh, so um, so I don't do that. I don't teach that kind of stuff. Um, my courses are are more about history or, you know, the the Dharma as it as we find it in early Buddhism, um, that kind of thing. The stuff that I can help with, you know, because I, I I wanted to find out say what, what can I help with? Okay, what what do I know about? You know, <laughs> I, there's a lot of stuff I don't, so I, I won't teach that. But the stuff I do know about, I'll try to teach. Um, so, so, that, so I agree with you 100. percent um, I think that's that's really really important to have a teacher, um, uh, or or a number of teachers. Um, I don't think you have to have a guru in the sense of the, I mean you know that of course in Tibetan practice you do, fine. Uh, that's good for some people. For other people, they don't particularly want to have that kind of relationship with a single person, but at least to have people you can talk to, uh, who who have some experience and can help you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, and. Uh, I think we will have to wrap stuff up in a, in a second, but uh, just to leave on a tantalizing note, you have a few videos about Buddhism and AI, <laughs> and if people can't talk to a teacher, how do you feel about them talking to GPT? What, uh, was, your, uh, what, was, what was the gist of those videos? Uh, how should we think about AI as Buddhists, if you had to summarize? Well, I think, I mean, AI, I think I find AI endlessly fascinating. Um, I studied it when I was in graduate school and, and philosophy. We talk about it all the time. We thought it was going to be a long way off so that it was sort of like a, you know, a thought experiment pretty much. And then, wow, I mean, my God, it's really exploded in the last year or so. Um, no, I don't, I don't think you should be taking uh, meditation <laughs> advice from, from chat GPT uh, or GPT-4 or whatever it is. Uh, but... I mean, I have to say, if you ask it Dharma questions, I mean, general Dharma questions, it knows a lot. It can answer really well. Um, it's it's startling. Um, and to me, it just is more evidence of non-self. I mean, it's just that the self is something that's a con construct and that you can build selves. I mean, that they're not, you know, it's something that's constructed out of stuff and, and mental and physical things that are all causally coming together. And this is not quite a self yet. It's it's something sort of like a self. Uh, but, you know, I think it's it, it tends to unsettle people because it's striking at that nerve in, within us that says, we are something special, this self. Mm. And it's like, no, it's just stuff. You know, it's just this causal stuff. And, you know, so someday there'll be selves made that, that are, you know, that have bodies made out of silicon. So what? <laughs> okay, that's another kind of self. Um, maybe they'll be able to come become enlightened someday. I don't know. Um, I hope so. It certainly would make things easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doug, if you are a large language model, you've been a delightful <laughs> one to, to talk with, but we do have to stop generating. So we uh, so appreciate the time and what you've done for uh, making the sasana and the teachings available to a wide variety of people um, while similarly balancing uh accessibility with a genuine respect and care for the tradition and uh, it's a pleasure if you're ever near seattle please come and pay us a visit thanks so much both of you Bantes. <laughs>